Welcome back YouTube. Today I'm going to be talking to you guys about a whole bunch of different topics and I actually don't even know what I'm going to be talking about because what I've done is I've gone onto my Instagram and I left a little question box on my Instagram story that lets you guys ask whatever questions you want for me to answer. I do this quite regularly on Instagram and I also go live on Instagram and live on Facebook every single day to answer your questions. However, given the constraints of Instagram story posts and the nature of live stream videos, I can't always go to the same level of detail that I'd like to go into some of the questions that I get. And I get a lot of really, really good questions. So I thought I'd use this as an opportunity to allow myself to go into the detail that I'd like to on a few of these different topics. Hopefully this works out well. Now I've actually got some questions I like to talk about <laughs> in this little question box here. Um, if it does work out, please do give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. It really does help this channel grow and helps me be able to create a lot more of this free content for you guys long term. I will also drop after the video, well, of course, after the video, I will put into the comment section below here a, um, a comment full of timestamps of all the different questions that I answer. So you can read ahead and jump through to whatever questions you care more about and use it as a reference or just watch the entire thing through, which is what I would recommend because that helps with the whole YouTube algorithm thingamajig that helps this channel grow even more. So I mean, if you even wanted to just like hit play and then go do something else and let the whole channel just keep playing through for the rest of time. That would be fantastic. That would be fantastic. Anyway, let's get stuck into some questions, shall we? Um, oh, okay, here we go. How much does alcohol influence your muscle gains? This question comes from Florin Serbu 99 Okay, so alcohol. Alcohol is something that I used to be very much against where I remember back when I was in like high school and university, I would drink a lot um, just as you would in your first year of university. And then I just saw it as such a um, opposite thing to what I was trying to do with my goals with bodybuilding and training and being a personal trainer that I just cut out alcohol cold turkey. And it was never really a difficult thing for me because this came down to the priorities and what I valued. At the time, what I really cared more about was the progress I could make in the gym and being as healthy as possible. And not knowing too much about it overall, I just saw alcohol as a bad thing because I just associated it as, oh, it's a poison. You know, your body has to detoxify the alcohol. Um, your body's going to store all the calories that you take in as food, as fat while you're drinking alcohol. All those different kinds of myths that get thrown around. And of course, you know, binge drinking back in university, definitely don't recommend that. Um, but you're going to wake up the next day with a pretty bad hangover. You're going to feel terrible and it's going to really impact your ability to train. So that was my mindset for the longest time with regards to alcohol. And I'd say even now I still have like a little bit of a subconscious thing in my head saying, oh, don't drink alcohol, it's not good for you. But when we look at it on a physiological level, and even if we start to go through some of the research on alcohol as well, the reality is it's actually not that bad. But of course, it really comes down to the dose and the frequency, or just like training, the volume and frequency of the exposures to training is what makes it beneficial or what makes it potentially poisonous and bad for you. So with respect to alcohol and how it influences muscle gains, alcohol in and of itself doesn't actually do a lot directly to impede your ability to burn fat or to disrupt the processes for muscle building either, which um, sounds kind of counterintuitive when you think about how many people abstain from alcohol and see it as a negative thing for your ability to make progress in the gym. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that we should be drinking every single day and we should, drink, we should be just drinking ad libitum. There should be some kind of limit to how much we take in and that's going to be a very personal thing. Um, but I think in and of itself, alcohol isn't necessarily bad, but it's more so what, um, what other behaviors tend to occur along with alcohol consumption and what also happens with the extra calories. 
So one thing you might not be aware of, or you, you might know, is alcohol does have calories. So we know that protein and carbohydrates, they have four calories per gram. Fat has got nine calories per gram. Alcohol has got seven calories per gram. So all else being equal, if you kept your diet the exact same and just had a couple of glasses of red wine or some beer or whatever it is that you like to drink that had, I don't know, maybe the equivalent, say 10, 20 or 30 grams of alcohol in it, that's going to bring with it a lot of extra calories, which if you're dieting could impede your ability to sustain a calorie deficit. And that's where you might associate it with fat gain, even though it's just not the alcohol itself, it's more so the calories. Um, and if we're looking at it from a muscle gain perspective, well, the extra calories is actually not that big a deal. Again, you might gain some extra fat, um, but you are just gonna get more calories in and assume that you had enough um, protein, carbs, fats to support your performance and your recovery, it's not that big a deal. Now, the things that I do care about more from a recovery, a muscle gain and a fat loss perspective are what alcohol tends to bring along for the ride with it. The biggest one being disturbances in sleep. So for me personally, I like to have you know, a glass of wine, maybe two glasses of wine every few days or so. Um, I'll have that with dinner or just like as a way to wind down after a long day. But I do notice that if I have a little bit too much or have maybe two or three glasses, or if I have certain like maybe a stronger type of alcohol, it will interfere with my sleep. And I do find even if I just have the one glass, but I do it every single day for a long period of time, that also starts to interrupt my sleep as well. And when it comes to fat loss and muscle gain, sleep's probably one of the most important things that we should be thinking about and trying to optimize as much as possible. Because yes, you can build muscle and yes, you can lose fat, um, provided you're in the right calorie and training setup and have disturbed sleep. But what the research does point towards is that your body will typically um, cannibalize more muscle tissue if you're in a deficit and it will put on more body fat if you're in a surplus when you have sleep disturbances. So that's the things that I really care about when it comes to alcohol is thinking about the calories that come with it and sleep disturbances and also probably the impaired decision making um, where with alcohol, you're probably going to find yourself being a little bit more relaxed with regards to your eating and that can bring with it a lot of extra calories or it could mean you're disrupting your meal timing in general and what you're eating in general and that can then obviously impact fat loss and, and muscle, gain, muscle gain goals. But as long as you factor in the calories for it, I don't think it's that big a deal as long as it, in, again, is within moderation and what is moderation? Something that you do need to identify for yourself. Good question. Let's find um, another one, shall we? All right. Philip Daman, you are asking, how do you like using jujitsu as a warm up? Do you see any benefit from it in your recent training? So if you don't follow me on Instagram, you might not be really aware of this, but um, I post up on my stories quite regularly, just me doing different jujitsu drills. Uh, because late last year around, so was it December? Yeah, December in 2019, I started doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which was quite poorly timed because within a couple of months of really getting stuck into it, a lot of the COVID-19 lockdowns came into effect and there hasn't been any um, Jiu Jitsu practice in terms of like actual in, in a Jiu Jitsu dojo for nearly six months now. But um, I've taken upon myself to do as much um, home drilling, solo drilling as I can by jumping through YouTube, jumping through a whole bunch of different DVDs and asking through a lot of different people in my networks, hey, what are some useful drills to do? Um, so some of the things that I do a lot of are different types of shrimp variations. I also do a lot of different bridge variations and I do a whole bunch of general rolling and just recently I've started to do, although this isn't ex exactly a jiu-jitsu drill, but started doing um, some cartwheel practice. And I usually incorporate this as a little bit of a warm up to my training sessions, which I personally really like to do. So the, um, uh, the question comes down to, do you really need to be doing this? Obviously not, because there are so many people out there who have successfully trained without ever doing jujitsu and don't do any jujitsu drills whatsoever. Um, but why do I do it? 
I do it for a couple of purposes. Um, first of all, this is something that I'm trying to just improve my skills at it so I don't lose my touch with the movement. So whenever I get to go back to doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in class, I won't have gone back that far. Or if anything, I feel like I've improved my technique significantly to the point where if I was to go back to class now, I feel like I should be quite improved. Because I spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes every single day drilling on these exercises. Um, repeatedly doing them over and over and over again, I'm sure it's going to pay off when it comes to actual grappling and um, rolling on the mats. But time will tell. Um, the main reason I'm doing it right now though, like pre-workout is it's pretty cold. And I believe that when you start working out, you shouldn't start training completely cold. You should start in some kind of state of readiness where your heart rate is elevated and maybe depending on the temperature outside or inside, hopefully you're going to have some kind of a light sweat on. This is all about preparing your body to, to train. Now you don't have to do jujitsu. You could be doing any kind of light cardio. You could even just be doing directly whatever exercise you're meant to be doing. So say we're going to be doing um, barbell squats as exercise number one. You could just do several sets of barbell squats or whatever mobility drills that you want or exercise that you want just to get your heart rate up and to get a light sweat going on to prepare your body. Everybody's got their own little thing they like to do. Um, and for the most part, personally, I prefer to use jujitsu right now because it's sort of kills two birds with one stone. The thing that I do like a lot about the jujitsu drills though is just the different movement patterns that it takes my body through. A lot of what we do in the gym is stuck in just one plane of movement. It's straight in front or behind your body in this plane here, or maybe it's out to the side. There's not much in the way of rotation um, occurring when you're doing a lot of the stuff that we do in the gym. And one thing that we, I guess can all just about agree on is that when it comes to um, movement quality and mobility, the most important thing is to keep moving as much as you can. And if you don't use it, you will lose it in terms of access to ranges of motion. And the best way to go about improving mobility long term is to um, practice going into as many different positions as you can. So jujitsu for me is a really good way to just take my body through as many different positions that it wouldn't normally go through and in a very, very um, non-rigid, um, unfixed and very, very fluid nature where every single repetition that I do is very, very different. Whereas when I'm training with weights, I'm trying to make sure every single repetition that I do is the exact same because it's going to be a very specific movement pattern that I want to be creating to elicit the response for muscle building um, and to stimulate the muscles that I want. So jujitsu is a good way for me to sort of break out of that paradigm and to keep both my body, my joints, and also my nervous system fresh. So. I do it for a little bit longer, say 15 to 20 minutes, because I'm really trying to practice the drills um, themselves all to bring my heart rate up. But if it was purely just for warming up in general, it'd probably be more like five or 10 minutes, just enough to get that heart rate elevated up. Um, but for all intents and purposes, I think people really overstate warm ups a little bit too much in terms of what they should be doing. Um, and when it comes over to choosing your exercise and warming up specifically for the exercise, the best thing to do is just the exercise that you're meant to be warming up for with a lighter weight and just build up the weight as you go. That's probably the most intelligent and specific way to go about preparing your body for um, whatever it is that you want to be doing. All right, um, next question. What I should say as well is if you guys do have um, if you guys want to know a little bit more about anything I talk about in these questions, feel free to drop a comment down below as well and just say, hey, you mentioned this about warm ups. Can you tell me a little bit more about blah, 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 whatever it was? Anyway, <sighs> next question from hmm, Michael Iano or Iano. I never know how to say that. Iano. Maybe one of you guys can tell me how to pronounce that name. G'day, legends. G'day, mates. Is tendonitis something that can be overcome? Definitely is, definitely is. So tendonitis is the degradation or the, the wear and tear and the breakdown of the pain that you experience in different joints in your body, like typically the tendons, hence the name tendonitis. Um, so 
a very, very common one that a lot of people experience is say elbow tendonitis. If it's on the outside, it's colloquially, colloquially known as tennis elbow. If it's on the inside here, it's known as golfer's elbow or medial and lateral epicondylitis, if you want to sound really clever, right? Anyway, what's going on there is the tendon hasn't been able to recover sufficiently and is starting to experience a lot of excess wear to the joints, to the tendon, and that's where you start to experience things like pain um, through movement. You may experience it all the time, or you may only experience it in certain exercises. It could be through repetitive motions like reaching for something or typing, or it could be in the gym. Now, is this something that can be overcome? Definitely, definitely, definitely. We need to understand what's going on mechanistically that's um, caused this to occur. So say it's the elbow joint here, but this could apply to obviously any joint and any tendon issue whatsoever, is actually a very, very simple equation that hasn't been balanced out. On one side of the equation, we have your tissue, your tendon's ability to recover, or what's commonly known within the, I guess, rehab circles as tissue capacity or tissue tolerance. And on the other side of the equation, we have the amount of force that we're applying to that area, the amount of force and stress being applied. And that could be through your daily activities of just typing or writing or playing tennis. It could be the applied force, the applied stress in the gym when you're lifting. So when the applied stresses or the applied forces to the joint exceed the joint's ability to handle that or the tolerance of that joint, you're going to get the degradation and then you're going to get over time pain and well, usually pain and um, discomfort. So what we need to be looking at here is reducing the force and the stress placed upon the joint whilst also doing what we can to improve the resilience or the capacity or the tolerance of that tissue. So the common mistake people make is when they're experiencing this mismatch here, hang on, that, yeah, this side is the extra stress, this side is the tissue capacity and tolerance. When they experience the pain um, or the tendonitis issue, they rest. And what the rest does is it brings this down but it does nothing to improve the tissue tolerance. And if anything, because you're no longer um, stressing out the tissue at all, because you're completely resting, the strength of the connective tissue starts to decrease as well. So you have this imbalance that's giving you pain and grief, and all you've done is you've brought them both lower. And as a result of this, you might not experience pain right now, but the imbalance is still there. And then the second that you go straight back into the gym and start training again, it goes right back up. And that's why you may feel like it's constantly recurring over and 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 over again, where you're chasing your tail, going through periods of rest and back into the gym and being in pain all over again. So what do we need to do? I think we need to be active, not passive, when it comes to dealing with things um, like tendonitis and trying to get our body training as effectively as possible. But it's about what kind of training are we doing? Obviously, the training that you're currently doing, it's what created the stress in the first place. So it's probably going to be a modification, not a removal, but a modification of your current training. So I've spoken a lot about the elbows actually in the past in other videos. I will um, pop a link into the, uh, into the description. If I can work it out, I'll even pop a video up here. Hang on, which slide will it be? Left or right? Up in one of these corners, I think. I'm still learning how YouTube works. Um, that links you guys over to a, a video I did on elbows and how to decrease the amount of forces and stress going through that joint. Um, but when it comes to specifically trying to improve the tolerance and the strength of the connective tissue, one thing that has been shown to make a tremendous amount of benefit is extended isometrics. And this comes from research from Dr. Keith Barr, who's probably the leading research on connective tissues and tendon rehab, um, where he would be using, I think it was maybe a 30 second protocol, where they would be doing um, 30 second low level, low intensity isometric holds um, for whatever movement, muscle, uh, connective, connective structure it was that you're trying to rehabilitate um, for I think it was four or five sets for about five minutes total and then they would do that a few times a day. I think it was two or three times a day and they would take that alongside with an infusion of vitamin C and collagen that would help um, with the restructuring and the strengthening of the connective tissue. The isometric contraction itself, being for an extended period of time, what it was doing is it's improving the pliability 
and it's, and it's deforming the connective tissue structure to help with the remodeling effect that we want to improve the resilience of it long term. That was a lot of really big nerdy words. Hope that made some kind of sense. Just do longer isometrics. That's usually something. I love to use extended isometrics in general though. Whether it's e even if it's not for a tendon specific effect, I like to use it more as a metabolic kind of thing or for blood flow as well, which could be good for recovery where I've had people going through, even myself going through like two to five minute isometric holds. Of course, the weight will be very, very light, but this can be a good way to provide some kind of stimulus to the muscle. Um, it's not the same as going through actual movement, of course, but given certain contexts and circumstances, Circumstances, it could be the best or the most appropriate thing or it could just be a very useful tool to have in your toolbox to improve things like blood flow for overall recovery. <sighs> Alright, next question. What do we have? Um, yeah, okay, so I have a couple of questions here that are um, asking the same kind of thing. Um, sister, sister underscore 26 asks, should you aim to eat meals by a certain time in the day? Latest, I should have breakfast. And Ms. Sophia Seals is asking, do you think meal timing is important? So concept is meal timing. How important is meal timing? Does it really matter when you have your meals? Um, should you be having carbohydrates at a certain time, fats at a certain time, protein at a certain time? Should you space your meals apart, have big meals? All those kinds of questions. What should I be doing about meal timing? So um, I think meal timing is absolutely important. It's one of those things where I know there are a lot of infographics going around, people saying, look, what's the most important for muscle building or fat loss? It's about consistency and compliance and adherence. Then it's about overall calories. Then it's about macronutrients, then micronutrients. Then at the very, very peak of this little thing here, there's like supplements and meal timing, indicating that those things are things you shouldn't be worrying about because calories are king and adherence is king and macros are king. Now, I do agree with that, kind of, but I actually don't like to use those kinds of models to explain these concepts because, yes, I think adherence, compliance is absolutely so, so, so important. I think it's, it's the most important thing. I think calories, you can't look past calories when it comes to your goals of muscle building or fat loss. You can't overlook that kind of stuff. But we can't look at it at the expense of something like meal timing. We can't look at it at the expense of something like macronutrients or micronutrients. You simply can't put these things on a hierarchy saying that one is more important than the other. These things have to be looked more, not in, in a pyramid, but more so in some kind of a kind of a matrix, I guess, where everything has its own equal weighting because it can all be important. It can all be important depending on who you're dealing with and, um, and what their preferences are. And also, I guess there are some physiological reasons as well. So from a meal timing perspective, assuming that you're having the same calories, the same macros, same micros, every, every single other thing, um, meal timing, is it really gonna make a humongous difference really for fat loss? Might not. For muscle gain, it might not. But you can also say in the same breath, it might. For example, um, we're looking at things like circadian rhythms here, where if we're having a lot of our meal, a lot of our food right before we go to sleep, um, that has the potential to disrupt your ability to get into a deeper state of sleep because it can disrupt your um, circadian rhythms. So this is still very much in its infancy, so don't take my word on this as complete gospel. This is what I've found for myself over the years. It, what makes, it's, it is what makes a lot of sense from a mechanistic, mechanistic perspective, and I do think in the future, it's something where a lot more research is going to be done, and we're going to have a lot of these aha moments when it comes to best practices with respect to meal timing. So what, what I think um, matters here is there are going to be certain times of the day where your body's in a heightened state of readiness. For example, first thing in the morning, there's typically a peak in cortisol, which is a stress hormone that helps you wake up in the morning. There's also gonna be an elevation in your core body temperature. There's usually going to be um, an increase in peristalsis, which is usually why first couple of hours in the morning, you would typically want to go to the bathroom. There are going to be certain 
points in time in the day based on our circadian rhythms where you feel a little bit more alert or where you feel a little bit more sluggish. Where typically, and this is going to vary tremendously person to person, but say from about 2 to 3-ish p.m., assuming that you woke up at about 6 to 8 a.m. roughly, um, you're going to feel a bit of a dip in energy. And this is part of a circadian dip where, you, where like for the Spanish and the Europeans, they usually have their siestas. And these are things that you actually can't avoid. It's ingrained into our genetics. And everyone's going to be a little bit different and they're going to express it a little bit differently. Um, but it is going to be there. And with that, digestion follows a very similar cycle as well. There are going to be certain times of the day where your digestive system is more primed to be breaking down, digesting and assimilating nutrients than other times of the day where it's not so much going to be primed to do that. That's why I like to keep some kind of consistency with my meal timing, even if I'm not training. So if I'm training, say, four days a week, on my three off days, even though I don't have that two or three hour like, gap where I'd normally be training or doing other stuff where I'm not eating, I try to keep things as consistent as possible and have the same kind of portioned sizes as if I was training. Because I think it's about getting the circadian rhythm um, component as optimized as possible. So what happens is if we're having a lot of our food right then in the evening, say an hour or half an hour before we go to sleep, I'm doing that all the time, and it's like at like 10 p.m. 10, 11 p.m. is generally speaking when a lot of your digestive machinery starts to go into sleep mode, or it starts to slow down, because your body's not anticipating a lot of food going in. But when you take in a lot of food at that time, it's going to do one of two things. It could start to disrupt your circadian rhythms, and that's where you start to get this uh, these mixed signals being sent to your body and it creates this thing where your body's sort of like, I guess, it's sort of like flying through many different time zones at the same time. Like when I was traveling last year, I barely knew what day it was. I barely knew what year it was because of how many different time zones I was jumping across through every single other day. I think the same kind of thing could be happening even if you're not traveling, but just by having such big fluctuations in your meal timing when there's no consistency whatsoever. So there is that that could have the potential to happen. The other thing that could happen though is because your digestive system has sort of slowed down for the evening and is winding down, all that food is just going to sit there in your body. And yes, it will get broken down, it will get assimilated, but while that's happening, while that's occurring, it could interrupt your body's ability to kick off all the other processes of helping your body fall asleep. And you could get all these different um, fluctuations in your blood sugar throughout the night as your body breaks down that food and then dips down into low blood sugar after being in cases in uh, periods of high blood sugar from having that meal. Long story short, there are a whole bunch of like, it depends factors to be considering here when it comes to meal timing. I think it's really important. Because as much as I've just said, like, I don't like to eat right before going to sleep, there could be some people where I might want them to do that because based on their circumstance, based on their context, they should be thinking about trying to get some food in before they go to sleep because it, help, it helps them sleep maybe. So I think it's definitely something that has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. There's not going to be a definitive rule here, but I think there are going to be some guiding principles with meal timing. And I think a big part of that is consistency. And I think it's something where Physiologically, meal timing might not matter a lot, although I have already just said here how I think there are a lot of cases where it could make a big difference physiologically, but let's even say that it didn't make a difference. Let's pretend for a moment that meal timing made absolutely no difference whatsoever from a physiological perspective from fat loss or muscle gain. Well, meal timing itself and having consistency with your scheduling of meals can still be really, really important from a compliance perspective, from your, from your ability to follow the plan and stick with it long term. So. When you have this pyramid saying adherence is king, calories are king, macros are prince or queen, and then whatever else it is, all the way coming up to, um, to this pinnacle here saying um, meal time is not really important whatsoever, I just realized how sexist that was. I said king, king, and then I said queen, as if queens aren't as important as kings. Let's change that around and like reiterate that. Compliance is king and queen. King and queen. Got to cut myself out for that one. Anyway, um, when we say meal timing is not important, but hang on, what if meal timing is that one thing that helps this person with their compliance? Now all of a sudden, meal timing is sounding a lot more queen and a lot less not queen. So those kinds of discussions are ones that need to really need to be had with respect to the importance of these different systems. 
with nutrition, with fat loss, and with muscle gain. And that's why I don't like this oversimplification in a lot of these concepts that we see in a lot of infographics. Because like, I really do believe we should be trying to make things as simple as possible for people to understand and digest. But at the same time, when we make things simple, when we start to reduce things down to help people digest it, we also have the risk, and I see this happening a lot, of losing a lot of very, very vital information. And the oversimplification starts to get in the way and create a lot more confusion than if we were to keep things a little bit more complex. But it really doesn't come down to complexity versus simplicity. I think it really just comes down to the effective communication of these concepts and make sure people understand the importance of the big picture. All right. Um, you know, I think that might be enough questions for today. It's a lot that I've gone through because it took a little bit longer, but I like being able to go through questions like this. Hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Um, if you did, drop a comment below, tell me that you loved it. And if you want to see more videos like this, please do just let me know. And you know, this is my first time doing an open Q and A like that. I reckon I might start doing these a little bit more regularly if you guys enjoy it. Anyway, I'll catch all of you guys next time. Hope you guys have a fantastic day, week, month, or however long it may be until I see you again. Peace out.